to pick up where we left off, we were finishing up with the movement of the electrons through the electron transport chain. And we were taking a closer look at what's going on in complex four. We've already seen the electron move through the other complexes. And now we're here at complex four, looking at how the electron is going to move in so that oxygen can come in and become that ultimate electron acceptor. So what's going on, here we have a couple of copper ions. These copper ions are going to serve as the place where the cytochrome C that picked up the electron from the end of that, all that stuff with the Q cycle we talked about in complex three, is going to come in and donate the electron to the copper ions. The electrons can then move through hemes at this point where the hemes are going to hold on to the electrons. Oxygen is going to move in. Now if we move to this next picture, we can see now that the heme and the copper has the electron, we're going to have to get a collection of four electrons. Then we get some oxygen moving in. That's going to pull in four protons. Electrons, oxygen, and protons work together to give us a product of water. This reaction where water is released is what's going to move the four protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. So now as we look at the entire process together, we can follow the electrons. If we, oops, if we start with NADH, the electron moves through complex one where it combines with ubiquinone or coenzyme Q. We pull in a few protons to get the fully reduced form of coenzyme Q, and we move four protons to the intermembrane space. Coenzyme Q would move to complex three. If it's FADH2, such as the succinate to fumarate reaction, the FADH2 is going to give two electrons to the coenzyme Q, again producing the completely reduced form of coenzyme Q. Again, going to complex three. Once the coenzyme Q is in complex three, it donates its electrons ultimately to cytochrome C. But of course, we remember we have to go through a process called the Q cycle to get both those electrons to a single cytochrome C because it can only carry one electron. Cytoch this process pulls protons into the intermembrane space. Cytochrome C then carries an electron over to complex four. The electrons are stored within copper ions and hemes until oxygen, protons, and the electrons can all come together to produce water. Again, we pull protons into the intermembrane space. So if the NADH is the electron donor, we get many protons in the intermembrane space. If FADH2 is the electron donor, we still get a bunch of protons into the intermembrane space. But the number will be a little bit different. With the NADH, we're going to ultimately get 10 protons moved into the intermembrane space for that one NADH molecule. And if you want to wonder why is it not 12, well remember, some of the protons we took we're going to be combined to give us the water. Some also move through the coenzyme Q. So it just doesn't add up exactly. With the FADH2, we'll ultimately get four less because we did not go through complex one. And we end up with a net total of six protons being moved into the intermembrane space. Before we move to how this electron flow can give us the, and the proton gradient can give us the ATP, Let's take a little quick look at what can happen if things go wrong. One thing that can go wrong with the electron transport chain is that free radical form of coenzyme Q that happens within the Q cycle can sometimes react with oxygen. When this happens, you get an oxygen radical. This can be damaging to enzymes, lipids, really lots of molecules within a cell. It can even convert into this radical species, which is more reactive and worse for you. So what our cells do to protect us is we have an enzyme that collects these oxygen radicals to produce peroxide. Then we can take the reduced form of glutathione, donate electrons to the peroxide, and turn it into water. 
Let's remember where this reduced glutathione comes from. It is made using glutathione reductase, which requires NADPH to reduce. And recall the NADPH that's produced here was one of the main reasons that we did the pentose phosphate pathway. Now getting back to our production of ATP, we're now ready to start looking at how can this proton gradient be a driving force that can produce ATP. So what we're going to see is we're going to we have this proton gradient because we've actively pushed the protons across we remove protons out of the matrix by getting our reduced form of coenzyme Q, which required the two protons when we added two electrons to coenzyme Q. So the point is we've done all of these things to pull protons into the intermembrane space, which annoyingly now your book begins to call the P side. Out of the matrix, which your book now begins to call the N side. So this is the matrix. This is the intermembrane space and we've been pumping these protons across. This difference in pH helps us get this force, the ability to use any energy we've reserved in this proton gradient to produce our ATP. So now what we're going to see, each of these little protons that we've thrown across as we went through the electron transport chain, are now going to slowly flow back through this very important protein called the ATP synthase or ATPase. And this is where we're going to make our energy. So let's look at this ATP synthase or ATPase. The ATPase has two parts to it. One area is known as the F sub 1 region. This is the part that is actually going to be within the matrix. It's going to be the part that we're going to see spinning, actually completing the combination of ADP and phosphate to make our ATP. The F sub 0 region, this is the integral membrane protein complex that allows the ATPase to span the intermembrane. So we're going to focus on the F sub 1 region because that's where the magic is going to happen. That's where we're going to make our ATP. There's three different binding conformations that we're going to see. It's, going to, it's actually three dimers, and each of these three are going to be in one of the conformations at some point, and they rotate. So if right now this dimer is in the open conformation, which is the empty conformation where you don't have anything bound, the one next to it wouldn't be in the empty conformation. It may be in the loose conformation where ADP and phosphate are bound. And then the next one, it's going to be in the tight conformation where ATP, the product, is being made. So that's a, a more true image of what the F sub 1 region looks like, but I think it's easier to see when we make it a little bit more cartoony. So what's going on in this example, we can pick any dimer to look at, and we can just follow along starting at any point. So let's say we start here. This is going to be the empty conformation. In the empty conformation, nothing is bound. The protein has changed shape so that nothing wants to be bound. This is going to happen when ATP has already been made and ATP is being released. Then as the entire F sub 1 region changes shape because as we see protons move through, the shape will now change so that it wants to be bound to an ADP and a phosphate. This conformation will have a binding site for both. Now they're both bound. More protons flow through. We change conformations again. This conformation allows the bringing together of the ADP and phosphate so that they can combine forming ATP in ATP will be bound in this conformation. Again, protons flow through. We change to the empty conformation, which nothing likes to be bound to. Now ATP is released. What we just explained going on within this red area would be happening in the other dimer at the same time so that we get an ATP production that's continuous. So that's the F sub 1 region.
So what's this F sub zero region doing? Well, it actually has an area called the central shaft. It's the gamma portion or the gamma protein. And that's what it's showing you with these green arrows. It is physically turning. So if we go to a different picture, this is showing you what's going on. And this area here is going to physically be turning. Now, the way it's drawn, it doesn't look like much. But remember, these are individual protein chains. And protein chains are made of amino acids. And we learned that all we have to do to change the shape of a protein is start messing with the different states of specific amino acids that we learned about, changing charges so that we have where charges were interacting, maybe they're now repelling each other or something like that. I really like this little picture. This is a picture where they use the fact that there's some histidine that's accessible in this region of the um, ATPase. And remember, histidine binds very strongly to nickel. So they just took the ATPase in different phases, and they bound it to nickel. And you can see it's physically turning. This is moving this, it's this direction, then as it turns, it turns down. We keep turning, it turns over. So it's just really cool. It shows you it is physically turning. So we got it. The turning changes the conformation. The changing in conformation, conformation allows ADP and phosphate to come together to make ATP. Great. This is biochemistry class, though. So why is it turning? Well, it turns out that there's an aspartate residue located at a pretty important region within the channel. And remember, what's flowing through this ATPase is a proton. Well, as the protons flow through, they will interact with the negatively charged aspartate residue. Well, now that's no longer negatively charged. That causes the rather large positively charged arginine residue to be repelled. The arginine residue is displaced, and that's how we get a turn. It's changing the shapes of the proteins as the protons flow through. Okay, So great, protons flow through this ATPase, we make ATP. But remember, in order to make ATP, we got to have ADP and phosphate, right? Well, good for us. Our bodies were designed that within the intermembrane of the mitochondria, we have two important transporters. We have the adenine nucleotide translocase. It's an antiporter. For every three ADPs that are brought in, four ATPs leave. And if you look at the charges of this, it's actually favored by the fact that it's more positively charged on the outside, on, on the intermembrane space. So it doesn't require any energy for this exchange. We also have a symporter called the phosphate translocase that brings phosphate molecules in at the same time it lets a proton in. But it's OK that this proton came in, because we got the electron transport chain somewhere back here on this intermembrane that is going to just pump those protons back across. Same thing is true for when we pump the protons across the ATPase. And they just get recycled and pumped back into the intermembrane space by the electron transport chain. Our last thing to think about as we're discussing ATP production in the mitochondria is how did we get the NADH into the mitochondrial matrix to start with? Well, some of the NADH is made within the mitochondrial matrix. The NADH produced in the citric acid cycle, as well as fatty acid, catabolism, it is made in the matrix, so it's ready to go. But we made some NADH in the cytosol during glycolysis, for example. So we've got to get that in. There's two ways to get the electrons from the NADH in the cytosol into the matrix. The NADH, remember, can transport easily through the porins of the outer membrane, so we just have to get it across the intermembrane. The best way to do that is by using the malate aspartate shuttle. The malate aspartate shuttle starts here, where oxaloacetate is converted into malate. That's not the important part. The important part is this reaction requires NADH, so it steals the electron that was being carried by the NAD. Now malate has the electron. Malate goes across a malate alpha-ketoglutarate transporter, 
Now the malate is in the matrix. Malate is now going to be converted into oxaloacetate. It's, it is oxidized to oxaloacetate. Now an NAD on the matrix side is reduced to NADH, and NADH can now go to complex one of the electron transport chain and begin producing energy. Well, what happens to the oxaloacetate? It is converted into aspartate. Aspartate can be transported across using the glutamate aspartate transporter, back out, and then converted into oxaloacetate. Remember, when we talked about the urea cycle, I posed the question of why do we use aspartate to be the second nitrogen donor of the urea cycle? And I discussed how aspartate is constantly being moved around. Well, here's one of the reasons why. The other option to get the NADH from the cytosol into the matrix of the mitochondria is using the glycerol 3-phosphate shuttle. Glycerol 3-phosphate takes the NADH, removes the electron by converting dihydroxyacetone phosphate into glycerol 3-phosphate. When glycerol 3-phosphate is converted back into dihydroxyacetone phosphate, this occurs using an enzyme that is located on the intermembrane. It directly makes FADH2, which can give the electrons to coenzyme Q within the intermembrane. But remember, when you have an FADH2, this is not the same thing as NADH. The FADH2 gives the electrons directly to the coenzyme Q, and then coenzyme Q skips complex 1, going directly to complex 3. So we won't get quite as much energy from the original NADH this way. Our final discussion in this chapter is looking at how all of this is regulated. Well, if you sit back and think about it, this is the converging process. The ultimate goal of this entire process is to produce ATP. So it's mainly going to be regulated by how much ATP we need. And the best way to do that is to regulate the process by the presence of NADH and ADP and phosphate. If there's a lot of NADH and there's a lot of ADP and phosphate, that means we've got electrons available. We don't have a lot of ATP because we have more ADP. So that's going to trigger oxidative phosphorylation needs to get going. Other things that can regulate this process would be the instances where we may have low oxygen. Well, if you don't have a lot of oxygen present, well, you don't have anything to accept the electrons. So you're going to need to stall the electron transport chain. Another possible thing we need to think about is all the other steps we've already talked about, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, they're ultimately converging at the respiratory chain. So we got regulation of oxidative phosphorylation actually occurring all the way throughout. So all those things I made you learn about regulation of glycolysis and oxidative and citric acid cycle, that is also regulating the electron transport chain. So unfortunately, we can't forget all those other steps that were regulated by mainly ATP and ADP, AMP, as we've been going along. So in conclusion in this chapter, you need to make sure that you can understand exactly how the electron flows through each of those complexes in the electron transport chain. You need to understand which part of that is going to allow the proton gradient to be formed. How do we get the protons into the intermembrane space? You need to understand how those protons can flow back through the ATPase, allowing us to make energy. How does the ATPase turn? What does that mean for it to turn and make energy? And of course, you need to understand how the presence of NADH and ADP and phosphate are going to upregulate glycolysis. How is that going to upregulate citric acid cycle? How is it also going to upregulate the electron transport chain.